This was in the uh, Chicago Tribune, uh, the ones yeah, yesterday, and it's a report of an incident in Miami. It really is incredible, as I think you'll feel when you hear it. Uh, Stephen Enoff, 87, 87 years of age, who plunged from a Miami bridge to the sound of taunting cries from truck drivers, died yesterday while still in a coma. Acquaintances told police that Enoff was despondent and lonely when he climbed to the top of the Little River Bridge two weeks ago. He plunged into the water as a bystander shouted, Come on, jump, jump. Uh, his only visitor in the hospital was Everett Staley, 21, who had pulled him from the waters. You know, ah, it's just unbelievable. You know, it just... I think all of us immediately say, no, no, they didn't mean it. I mean, they didn't mean it. And uh, maybe they didn't mean it. You know, maybe that's right. Maybe they didn't mean, maybe they thought the old man was only pretending when he was standing on the bridge. Maybe that's so. I think we're all a little skeptical, maybe, when we say that. And yet we all feel, well, he couldn't mean it. They couldn't mean it. They couldn't have meant to make him jump to his death. I mean, it was a mistake. They couldn't mean that. If they were human beings at all, they couldn't taunt an old fellow of 87 to jump off a bridge to his death. I think we all feel that, don't we? We all feel if they were human beings at all, they couldn't have meant to do as cruel a thing as that. And I think many of us feel that, that when human beings are insensitive to each other like that, when they're as cruel to each other as those truck drivers were, when they're as indifferent to the predicament another poor soul is in as they seem to be, then we always tend to say, at that time they were possessed by something that wasn't human at all. It was something utterly inhuman. And we ourselves have found that we've been in the same position. We've discovered a resentment boiling up inside us against another person that didn't even seem to be part of us ourselves. It seemed to be something that was apart from us completely. And you remember we've often said that it had such control of us that at times it seems supernatural. Now, brothers and sisters, that's the power that we have been discussing now for several months. It's the power that is outlined there, you remember, and mentioned in the verse that we'll study today. It's Romans 6 and verse 18. It's that power. Romans 6 and verse 18, it's page 981 in the Black RSV. Uh, Romans 6 and 18, And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. And uh, the word sin is actually two Greek words, including the article, he hamartia, the sin. And it means the power of sin. Now, that's the power that presumably made the truck drivers taunt the old man to jump. And that's the power that often seems to take over your will and mine. When we want to be patient, this power seems to take over and make us impatient. It's a power that is different from another word for sin that we notice in Romans 6 and 16. If you look at that just two verses back, in verse 16 the word sin is mentioned again, do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin? Now, their sin does not have the article at all, and I suppose I'm an incorrigible school teacher, and the difference there is that the sin, you see, is the power of sin. Whereas sin in Greek, it looks like, uh, uh, those of you who know uh, Greek, it looks like hamartia. And uh, the other one has the... Uh, article before it, ha, he hamartia. And uh, this one means the power of sin. This, mean one, this one means the outward expression of sin. Maybe the act or the thought or the word. 
And the one we're talking about these months is the power of sin. The inward power that seems to make you want to assert yourself and defend yourself, to have your own way, to be God, to do what you want to do. It's the thing, presumably, that would make even one of the truck drivers sense that maybe the fella was serious and maybe I shouldn't do it. But this power inside him makes him want to have his own way and he wants to have a joke, so he taunts the old fella. It's that power that we're talking about, don't we? And it's that power that seems to get hold of people today in the world. It seems to be supernatural. It seems to be a hideous, inhuman drive to have your own way, to assert yourself, to do whatever you want to do, whatever effect it will have on anybody else. The uh, contemporary psychologists are calling it, in vague terms, the essential perversity of mankind which at least they're now recognizing that mankind is perverse. But they call it that. Uh, They maybe call, uh, some of it we call in educational circles, uh, you want to develop. You're an overdeveloper, is that it? There's another phrase for it. You're an overachiever, yes. You're an overachiever. Because you want to trample everybody else under feet to get up to the top of the heap yourself. And you're an overachiever. Uh, So often when we are talking about rivalry or competition or envy or jealousy or unrest within, we give it nice names. Jesus, whom we believe to be the unique Son of God, said this power is the antagonism and hostility towards God which a certain being feels who has rebelled against God in pre-eternity. Jesus said that person we call at times Satan. But he is a supernatural being who has such antagonism and hostility towards God that it just produces ridiculous inhuman results. And that's what we feel inside us when we get angry, when we get irritable, when we do the kind of things that the truck drivers did. We really accept this attitude of hostility that Satan has towards God and we make it our own. And the tragedy, of course, with many of us is we've discovered that not only has it produced many disastrous traits in our own character, like extreme selfishness and knotted up resentment that prevents us getting to sleep at night and a tremendous envy and jealousy that drives us to achieving more and more and more and a tremendous greed and covetousness that we cannot control. But I think many of us would admit that this power seems to have got hold of our own wills so that we are not even free to exercise our wills. Our wills seem fettered by this power so that we cannot seem to be able to unchain them. And that's why for most of us here it has been such a deliverance to see that God destroyed that selfish fettered will in Jesus on Calvary in a pretemporal, supraspatial miracle. He took our selfish and chained wills and he put them into Jesus and he destroyed them with Jesus. And that he is able to actualize that destruction in our own lives today. So really, it's a bit like having a leg with gangrene in it. You cannot do anything about it yourself. All you can do to prevent the poison spreading throughout your body is to give a surgeon the right to amputate. Now that's the only ability we have in this predicament. We can give God the Father the right to actualize in us the destruction of that self-centered will and the substitute, the substitution of the free loving will of Jesus. And you remember we've talked often about how that comes about In Romans 6 and 11, there's the first step. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin. It means you have to reckon yourselves dead with Jesus to the right to men's respect, to the right to success in your career, to the right even to satisfaction in your marriage and your domestic life. You must consider yourselves dead to those rights and alive only to Jesus. And then in verse 13, do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life. Then you yield yourself moment by moment 
to instantaneous obedience to the Holy Spirit. And what we find is that when you do that, the Holy Spirit reproduces in you the very life of Jesus. And reproduces in you the very attitudes that Jesus himself expressed in his own life. And you remember it's uh, expressed there in Galatians 5 and 22 through 23. Galatians 5 and 22 through 23. And that's page 1015. 1015. In Galatians 5 and 22, these are the attitudes that are born by the Holy Spirit in a person who is willing to die to self with Jesus. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And there's no law, of course, because the laws are simply descriptions of the way the Holy Spirit acts. And when the Holy Spirit fills you completely, then he automatically reproduces the things that are described in the law, both the Ten Commandments and the laws in the New Testament. And that's why, brothers and sisters, in Romans 6 and 18, today's verse, we read that description. In verse 18 of Romans 6, Having been set free from sin we have become slaves of righteousness. In other words, you enter into a victorious life that is filled with obedience to God's law and that reflects the life of Jesus spontaneously. Now really, this is the heart of the experience. It is a deliverance from an inward resistance to God. That's the heart of it, dear ones. Being filled with the Holy Spirit or being crucified with Christ or dying to self or baptism with the Holy Spirit, whatever name you give to it, that experience or that level of life is an experience of being delivered from the resistance to God's will. It's a freedom from an inward weight. It's a freedom to obey God. It's an experience that where before you know you wanted to be patient, but the irritability was boiling up inside you. Now the irritability isn't boiling up inside you. It's that kind of an experience. Now, you may say, is it automatic, brother? Uh, is it automatic? Do I just find love and joy bubbling forth from me all the time? Loved ones, as you allow the Holy Spirit to reroute your personality that has been programmed for so many years by self, as you allow the Holy Spirit to rewrite your personality, yes, the life of Jesus becomes increasingly automatic and natural and spontaneous within you. But always the Holy Spirit is leading you into new situations which require new choices. And so it's better not to call it automatic, but rather to say that you're free to choose at last. You're free to choose. Where before your roommate uh, threw all your clothes all over the bed and you came in and you weren't free to choose, you had no choice. You all went one way, you went straight for him or straight for her without any doubt. You weren't free to choose at all. You just went straight at them and tore them apart in words. Now, the Holy Spirit cleanses that inward sin from your heart so that you're free to choose. And so that it is a moment by moment choosing to obey God. In fact, that's really one of the best ways to put it. It's a freedom to obey God. Before you weren't free. You wanted to obey God, you wanted to love other people, but you weren't free because of the hatred that rankled inside you. Now you're free to obey Him. Some people have called it, you know, perfect love. You find your heart filled with a perfect love for God and a perfect love for your brothers and sisters. You find that you have pure intentions. That's one of the big uh, changes. Your intentions become pure. Uh, I remember so often standing up in front of people and, you know, I had an intention to glorify God, but I had also an intention to glorify myself a little on the side. And so the intention was not pure. It was a double mind. It was not a single-minded love of the Father. Now, the Holy Spirit, when he cleanses and fills you, gives you an intention that is devoted to glorifying and pleasing God in every way within your power. Now, that's why, brothers and sisters, the Bible at times describes it uh, as really constituting uh, an ability to do what you know is right and an ability to 
uh, avoid what you know is wrong. And uh, you know that, that those are the things that make our life miserable as defeated Christians. It's not the things we don't know about that trouble us. It's the things we know we should do and we cannot do. It's the things that we want to stop doing and we cannot stop doing. Those are the things that destroy us and that bring guilt. Now, really, the Holy Spirit fills you so that you can do that. That's, uh, it puts you in the position of James, James 4 and 17, if you like to look at it. James 4 and 17. It's page 1056, where God defines sin very clearly. James 4 and 17. Whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So God says, if you know what you ought to do and you don't do it, that's sin. And if you know what you should stop doing and you can't do it, that's sin. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes, he delivers you from that resistance to God's will so that you are free to avoid what you know you should avoid. And really, that's why the Bible takes the further step, you see, and makes that strong statement in the verse we read in the lesson. 1 John 3 and verse 9. Which many of us, you see, are, are very slow uh, about believing. 1 John 3 and 9. No one born of God commits sin. And that's what God means. The Holy Spirit frees you from the resistance to God's will that you had before frees you from that tremendous desire to deify self and to have your own way, and so you're free at last to do what you know is right. And of course, if you do what you know is right, then you're not committing sin. And God says, really, sin is knowing conscious disobedience to my will. And what my Holy Spirit does through the application of the death and crucifixion of Jesus to your selfish will is he frees you to obey me. That's why that verse goes even further, and some of us, you know, uh, may uh, have a little difficulty with it. Uh, you see, uh, 1 John 3 and 9b, uh, No one born of God commits sin, for God's nature abides in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Well, that's why uh, John puts it so strongly. I suppose, actually, you could sin if you wanted to. You're always free to sin. But at last, you're free not to sin which you never were before. And so, in a sense, obeying God becomes as natural to you as obeying Satan was before. Sin becomes as alien to your whole being as obeying God used to be before. And so, in a sense, it becomes quite difficult for a person to sin. They have to make a conscious determination to disobey God after the Holy Spirit has cleansed them from that resistance to God's will. Now, loved ones, could I tackle... Uh, the uh, uh, little uh, woodworms that are trying to get into our heads at this moment. Um, one of them is saying, sinless perfection. That's what it is. Sinless perfection. And uh, they're urging you to get a stake and burn me, but this is asbestos, this suit. So, <laughs> don't worry. so now, Dylan, first of all, uh, it isn't sinless perfection. I'll explain why in a moment. But uh, let's look at how far we've fallen. When we put a phrase like sinless perfection, which I wouldn't attempt to defend, it's uh, too hot uh, an item, uh, but we put a phrase like sinless perfection in the same uh, category as bad breath. We really do. We reckon if we label something sinless perfection, that's it condemned without question. Now, loved ones, I urge you to be slow on that kind of thinking since we all will probably have to put up with a lot of sinless perfection for eternity. And so, we should go a little gentle on downgrading it or using it as a term of opprobrium, a term of contempt, a term of criticism. But let's look at what we're talking about. Is it sinless perfection? Brothers and sisters, the victorious life, a life filled with the Holy Spirit, is a life that is delivered from resistance to God's will. A life that is delivered from that inward desire to deify and glorify self. It is a life that has been freed to obey. 
It is not an automaton kind of life. It is not a robot life. You can still disobey if you want to. But it is a life that has been freed from the weight inside that prevented it obeying. But it still has to obey. It is a life that still has to obey. And as soon as you say that, brothers and sisters, you are involving yourself in other parts of the personality besides the will. You can say the will has been freed to obey, but the way you obey God is by your lips, by your tongue, uh, with your body, with your mind, and with your emotions. Now, obedience is involved with those other three parts of your personality. Your body, your emotions, and your mind. Now, do you see that one of the effects of living without the Holy Spirit for years and in mankind for centuries was that our minds became impaired. And so our minds often are slow and are incapable of perceiving what God wants at the time. And so often we will make mistakes. Often you will think that a certain approach to another person will draw them towards God, and it will just put them off completely. And you'll make an absolute mistake about the whole thing. Often you will quote a fact that isn't true at all, and the other person will hear the fact, will look it up in a book, find it isn't true, and he'll just say those Christians are just con men. So again and again, you'll find that you're doing your best with a mind that often makes mistakes. You'll be in the position that uh, Peter was, you remember, in Galatians 2. You might want to look at it. Uh, It's the last reference I'll ask you to look up, and it is one instance of a person whose will was delivered. Uh, But he was an apostle. And certainly he showed that his mind was still trying to work out the best way and at times making mistakes about it. Uh, Galatians 2 and verse 11. But when Caiaphas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, Paul says, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And with him the rest of the Jews acted insincerely, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their insincerity. Now, brothers and sisters, in the light of Peter's letters and the life of suffering that he endured, you cannot say that Peter was scared of what people would think. He already fought that one out with the little girl in the courtyard when Jesus was being tried. But what Peter was involved in was a real error of judgment. He first of all thought... Well, heathen don't need to become Jews before they become Christians. And so he started to eat with the Gentiles. And then he began to think, well, maybe that's not true. Maybe I shouldn't offend the Jews. And I'd better stay away from the Gentiles. And of course, Paul differed with him completely and accused him of acting insincerely. Now, dear ones, do you see that often we will deviate from absolute perfection because of the imperfections of our minds? Often we'll make mistakes in judgment. Often we'll commit unintentional sins that we don't realize we committed until it's done, you know. And then we look back and we say, oh, I did that. I shouldn't have done it. Well, the Father is just has his arms open towards you. He's not standing up there condemning you for something that was unintentional and that was done in a moment before you realized it. Often, in other words, if you want to call them sins, call them sins. Though the Bible does say that a sin is what you know is wrong. But if you want to say that your life can have some unintentional sins in it, it can have mistakes in it, it can have involuntary deviations from God's absolute perfection that you didn't really intend. Now, loved ones, do you see, that means that you can't be said to be in absolute perfection. You can't be said to be living in sinless perfection. If you're living with some mistakes, with some mistaken moves, some things that you didn't really intend to do, and yet they deviate from absolute perfection. So a better word is perfect obedience. It's true, too, that our emotions have become unbalanced. Some of you, you know, are just very emotional people. You know that. And some of us are very cold. And because of that, we deviate from God's absolute perfection in both directions, even though we intend the best. You want that person to know how glad you are that they're here at the theater, 
but you are a gusher. You gush. Yeah, just like that. And you just gush out the emotionalism. And you swamp them with all kinds of paternal and maternal love. And you suffocate the poor wee souls. And they bow never again. And it's not that you intended to. It's not that you designed to hurt them or you designed to glorify self. It's just that the emotions have not really come into complete balance and the old affection is not yet under the control of the Holy Spirit. Some of us are the same in the other directions. We're Scandinavian, you know. <laughs> no emotion. That's not true. Norwegians and Swedes, certainly. But we're, we tend to be colder and we don't show so much emotion, yet we love the people with all our hearts. But they go away thinking they don't care about you at all. Now, do you see that, strictly speaking, you're deviating from absolute perfection? But it's not a deviation that has malice in it or that is designed to get your own way or to disobey God. Similarly with your body. Our bodies are weakened by the years that we've lived without the power of the Holy Spirit. The years that we've lived in psychosomatic diseases, in strains of all kinds, our bodies are weakened and repeatedly, Satan will move in in temptation through these weakened bodies, through bodies that have become used to certain patterns of behavior, through bodies that submit to flu and colds, through bodies that press in upon the Spirit in a thousand ways. You'll deviate from God's absolute perfection because of the pressure of the body. So, brothers and sisters, in many ways, I'm sure that you will not live a life of sinless perfection. But the beauty of it is, loved ones, that those things that come to you that way do not bring guilt. They bring an immediate sense. The Father understands. Lord, you know I didn't intend that. There's a beauty of Jesus' love and forgiveness comes down to you and the thing is adjusted in a moment by a quick adjustment. But what is the truth of the victorious life, loved ones, is the Holy Spirit delivers you from self, delivers you from that desire to disobey God, that desire to hold resentment and antagonism towards another person. The Holy Spirit can fill you with a pure intention and a life and a heart of perfect love. And that is like living in heaven. And that you cannot stay back from. And you cannot step back from that definition. That the Holy Spirit delivers you into a life where you're freed from sin. That's what Romans 6 and 18 says. You're freed from sin and you become a slave of righteousness. Now, as the Holy Spirit gives you more and more light, so you can come increasingly free of that natural soul life that we just outlined there in connection with the mind and emotions and the body and that we normally talk about in the Sunday evening services in the fall and the winter. How we can be gradually disciplined by the Holy Spirit so that even the soulish powers become subservient servants and effective expressions of the life of Jesus. Purposely want to stop and give an opportunity at least for a minute of questions, Jones, since many may be troubled about it. It is 12.07, so I could just give you a minute, and maybe, maybe there are no questions. That's, that's good. If you say, what do we do, brother, if we are not yet delivered from self? You walk in the light, brothers and sisters. That's what Jesus promised. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sin, known and unknown. You walk in the light, you hunger and thirst after the deliverance from self that Calvary brings. And if you say to me, but brother, I'm not free of it yet, well, the Father is not going to condemn one who is hungering and thirsting after his righteousness. One who is standing against that resistance in his heart with all his power that he can muster. Even if he's still doing it in his own strength, God will make the revelation real to you of your death with Jesus if you're walking on in all the light. We have a loving Father, dear ones, not a great judge, you know, but a loving Father who wants to do everything to deliver us into our free life. Really. Let us pray.